Calls. Hello and welcome to the final episode in this season of Ocean Calls, our Euronews podcast for friends of the sea. I'm your host, Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes. We're going to break away from our three-way conversational format in this episode as we'll be listening to experts on a very important ocean topic, sound. We all teach our children, don't we, that that fish don't make any noise at all. But actually, fish are really vocal. Lower frequency noises do actually travel and can do across ocean basins. When sound becomes noise, it has devastating some impacts. The Russian missile attack is possibly coming soon. Yes, we're talking about the sounds of the sea. How should the sea sound? And how does it sound if you're a fish, a dolphin or a shrimp? What are the noises made by marine animals? And what are the impacts of sounds made by humans travelling across the oceans, diving deep to mine for resources, or even waging war across the water? In this episode, we're tuning in to experts on underwater noise in all its forms. And at the end, it's your turn to show your expertise as we've put together an ocean sounds quiz. So listen up and let's get started. My name is Nicholas Entrup. I am Director for International Relations at Ocean Care. My first experience out there was above the water, and it was not below the water, and it was kind of a nighttime, and I heard orcas breathe at night, and you, you, you knew the animals out there, you couldn't see them, but to me it was kind of an experience. I thought, wow, this is absolutely fantastic. It's like even <laughs> like in a, in a kind of a, a movie, um, so to speak. Nicholas Entrup has been working on marine conservation issues for almost three decades. And one of the main focuses of his work right now is to achieve a framework to reduce underwater noise in our oceans. The underwater world is a world of sound. It's an acoustic world. When sound becomes noise, it has devastating impacts. We differentiate between noise sources that cause a kind of a acoustic fog, so to speak, which is shipping. You know, shipping appears all over the world's oceans. The other sources are the more kind of explosive, what we call impulsive sound noise sources. And those are, for example, when you search for oil and gas sources in the seabed, for example, military noise, In recent years, there's been a growing recognition of the need to reduce human-made noise in the ocean to protect marine ecosystems. For example, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea requires that states take measures to protect, reduce and control noise pollution. But it's difficult to get everyone to agree. The most regulated noise sources are the ones from renewable energy sources, like when you construct wind farms in European waters. When you look at military noise, that's, of course, most of the times argued to be exempted from any kind of environmental legislation because of national security issues. The oil and gas industry has been very, very active to work intensively against any type of regulation. So how exactly does underwater noise impact our ecosystems? Nicholas Antrop says the biggest observable impact is to marine mammals like whales. This starts with um, an impact which we call masking. Masking is kind of you prevent, because of the noise emissions, the communication between two individuals because it's simply getting too loud. I was just going to say, it's me and you in the nightclub and I'm trying to have a chat with you and you're the other side of the dance floor. It's not going to happen, is it? (laughs) It, It's not going to happen, absolutely. (laughs) Sounds that are too loud can also be quite painful. There is, for example, a term which means a temporary hearing loss. 
and temporary hearing losses when you bring back the discotheque or a loud rock concert and you know your hearing is impacted and you wake up the next day and it's still ringing in your ears but a few days later you know it's gone and you know you've you've been fit again so to speak and this is of course happening in the wild in the ocean as well however when it's not a temporary hearing loss but a but a constant that means death you know, because you not have the ability anymore to hunt or to hide. And there is also the phenomenon of, of a so-called atypical mass stranding. What does it mean? It's when at the same time, in a kind of the same area, animals from different species strand. And all of those phenomena of atypical mass strandings have been linked to intense noise events, whether it's military or whether it's from the oil and gas industry. But of course, those strandings are just the kind of the peak of the iceberg, because most of the times you will never, ever witness, you know, the whole impact because you know, an animal will, will, will die out there in the ocean, will never appear. So ocean noise can have lots of impacts on big marine mammals, but it can also have an impact on fish and even the smallest ocean animals. You had a study in Australian waters where they observed the impact of one single air gun that emits sound to up to 240 decibel and it killed all the larvae from zooplankton in an area of 1.2 kilometers radiation. An air gun is a device used in seismic surveys for oil and gas exploration. It sounds like this. There has been a study that documented a kind of a, the background noise of a seismic survey had a hundredfold impact to 300,000 square kilometers. It's hardly measurable for us because sound travels much further and faster in, the, in, in water compared to the terrestrial in the air. And when the fish in our oceans aren't doing well, coastal communities feel it too. Whenever there is a seismic survey, there's lots of compensation going on from the oil industry towards local fishermen because they can't go out at the time, but also because you have an impact on fish stocks. That was documented, for example, in Norwegian waters. It can scare the fish away. It can just change the prey and, and hunt relation because of different species. Every single species that has been subject of a study of the impacts of noise pollution has been documented, yes, there are impacts and there are negative impacts caused. Air guns, sonar, pile driving for construction. These are noisy but often relatively short-lived sources of noise pollution. It seems the worst of all is more constant and banal in its origin, the sound of engines. It's the constant droning. It's the constant emission that is taking place. And I think it's a very good example when you live in a visual world and you're um, your eyesight is just really impacted all the time by kind of a, a, a visual fog. This is happening in the ocean in its constant impact. And this is why there are lots of efforts now in the European Union, for example, in its waters to go for thresholds. And actually, at the end of last year, thresholds have been defined. It's a very complex matter, but I think we are moving now to a new era where noise will be more and more regulated in waters such as European waters, but hopefully on the international level as well, because that's what's needed. The EU is home to some of the world's largest ports, including Rotterdam, Antwerp, Hamburg and Marseille. According to the European Environment Agency, around 38% of global maritime traffic passes through European waters, with the Mediterranean and Baltic seas being particularly busy areas. I think when it comes to shipping, there is a very, very easy rule and it's basically you can also compare it to the streets and it's just going slower if you reduce the global fleet the speed by 10 percent you would reduce noise emissions by 40 percent did you know that the male midshipman fish found in the mediterranean sea sings unique serenades during the mating season to attract female and establish their territory, male midshipman fish produce a deep humming sound that is often described as a boat engine and can continue for several hours. Now to a very different kind of marine noise pollution. 
On February the 24th, 2022, Russia initiated devastating strikes on Ukrainian cities, targeting critical locations such as the Black Sea ports of Odessa, Chornomorsk and Mariupol, situated along the adjoining Sea of Azov. More than a year on, those strikes continue. I'm, I'm sorry, here, here you can hear uh, the sound of the air raid alert. The Russian missile attack is possibly coming soon. So uh, this is the alert sound you can hear in the background. The news media has understandably extensively focused on the devastating effects of the war on the people of Ukraine, meaning the environmental consequences of this conflict are often overlooked or rarely discussed until now. Hi, I'm Pavel Goldin, and I'm a researcher, a leading researcher in the Schmalhausen Institute of Zoology in Kyiv, Ukraine. Every day we got used to hear a lot of kinds of explosions and uh, the noise produced by Russian missiles. Because Russians use uh, their submarines as a platforms for missile start, the submarine is around 50 meters underwater. Fortunately for us, they do not reach the Ukrainian territory, but unfortunately for all the marine life, they fall into the water. Another source of noise is the noise produced by radars. Scientists don't yet know the full impact that underwater explosions and sonar can have on animals. What we can hypothesize, the cetaceans can get a kind of blast injury. So the blast injury is a kind of injury which could be posed on the brain and on the hearing system. It can cause numerous hemorrhages and in the worst cases, a, a real breakage of um, bones and of uh, real passages, uh, cavities inside the uh, skull and the hearing system. So this is a kind of mechanical impact. Now that kind of injury is quite easy to imagine, but some of the effects are more difficult to evaluate. Any blast can lead to displacement of fish stocks. Because if any fish, they have a swimming bladder and then they do not like loud sounds. And um, this eventually leads to displacement of the cetacean stocks. Uh, also, there are numerous other effects of stress. The cetaceans became less cautious and they more frequently can get to fish and gas, uh, eventually by caught, or they can suffer from hunger because they cannot find their prey and eventually they become accessible to various infectious diseases and so on. The Black Sea is connected with the Mediterranean Sea through the Bosphorus Strait and it's home to several cetaceans. One of them is the harbour poppies. The poppies... Uh, is the animal uh, belonging to a family which is a sister family for dolphins. The harbour poppies is very quiet and shy animals, which is easier to be disturbed. Also, there are two species of dolphins, the common dolphin and the bottlenose dolphin in the Black Sea. There are some noisy habitats uh, near the straits, like the Bosphorus or the Kerch Strait, but generally the Black Sea is uh, much safer and quieter than most of the European seas. But that was before the war. Since the start of the Russian invasion, scientists have been recording mass deaths of dolphins on the Black Sea coast of Ukraine, Russia, Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey. Hundreds of dead animals have been washed ashore with no visible signs of injury. The first researchers who recorded the uh, mortality of cetaceans, these were our colleagues from Turkey, from the Tudav organization. They started to record dolphin deaths from the end of February. Currently, Goldin and his team don't have direct access to the area, so the scientists rely on locals for their research. Right now, our abilities are quite limited because, first of all, we can go to the sea itself and uh, so we cannot do our abundance surveys, for example, from the boat as we usually do. We can only collect uh, carcasses of stranded animals and observe 
animals just nearby the shoreline. And also we use the remote data collection equipment, such as satellite images uh, when available, the drone images, and also we actively use the data from the citizen science. The greatest help which can be given to the Black Sea Dolphins now is the help to the Ukrainian army. Now the Ukrainian army is the greatest environmental conservationist in the region. The second thing is what we can do in terms of post-war restoration of ecosystems. I'm quite convinced that we should establish new marine protected areas to get dolphins more and better protected than now and also to improve our fish and gas to reduce bycatch. Did you know that there is sound coming from the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the world's oceans? After placing an underwater microphone at its lowest point, called the Challenger Deep, scientists heard a strange low-frequency sound that seems like boiling water. This sound is not completely understood, but might be caused by geothermal activity or water movement in the trench. For those who grew up close to the sea like I did, it's easy to imagine how the crashing waves, droning engines and busy humans or animals can create a cacophony of sound near the surface and close to the shore. But most of the ocean is deep and dark. What does it sound like there? And how will that change, especially as new businesses like deep sea mining for precious minerals begin to invade the silent abyss? We don't know much about the species that inhabit those areas and there's a lot more research that's needed and we also don't know much about the kinds of effects that mining might have in future. That's Kirsten Thompson. She's a population biologist at the University of Exeter in the UK and an author of a study on the potential impacts of deep sea mining. If you're new to this topic, then try listening to our podcast episode debating deep sea mining, a very controversial emerging industry. Yeah, we were interested to find out, A, what species might be recorded in areas that are earmarked for mining in the future, and then try to assess what the potential impacts might be on these species, given uh, research using, well, whatever literature we could find. What we try to do in our paper is look at other types of industries and use those as a proxy for what noise might be emitted. The area that's set to be the most impacted by deep-sea mining is known as the Clarion-Clipperton zone. It's a huge, mineral-rich patch in the Pacific Ocean. Mining is not a commercial reality in the deep sea yet, so we don't have a full picture of what those sounds might be. I think it's reasonable to assume that should this become a commercial reality, it will be operating 24-7 and at different parts of the water column. So you would expect that there would be a broad range of frequencies emitted if it's um, high-frequency noises. And that is something like this. And those don't travel that far in water, but lower frequency noises do actually travel and can do across ocean basins. Just to give you an idea, a lower frequency noise might sound like this. So we would expect that there would be collector vehicles on the seafloor that would be making, you know, various sort of low, low frequency noise to mid frequency noises. And then, of course, with the added extra shipping that this industry will obviously entail, then you're going to have different types of noise at the surface as well. So some species will vocalise within the high frequency ranges, so things like the beaked whales and some of those other, you know, quite rare species. The baleen whales are vocalised generally within the much lower frequencies. And how those, you know, anthropogenic noise impacts them will depend on that frequency range that they're communicating within. Changes in animal behaviour have already been observed in noisy areas. Some of the most more recent papers have suggested that during the construction of wind farms that you do have certain species like harbour porpoises that will move out of those areas during that construction. 
And so far, some of these studies have suggested that they may well move back into the era once the construction has ceased. So that potentially may well exclude animals from the area, and we might not know what um, impact that might have on those populations. The deep sea is famously understudied, so we have limited knowledge about who lives there and who visits. But it is known that some animals will quite regularly dive down over a thousand metres to hunt for food. The beaked whales in particular are the deep diving species that are known to um, inhabit some of these offshore areas. And there are records of beaked whales in the clarion Clipton zone. You know, we don't know that for sure, and we need to know more about what these animals are doing there. Um, but in the case of the beaked whales, we know that they're highly sensitive to noise in other areas of the world, and particularly some of the more high frequency noise. They're quite sensitive animals, and we don't really know much about their ecology. So how noise might impact these offshore species is, is really a question and, and quite a concern particular for that, that group. Deep sea miners argue that the minerals that can be found at the bottom of the ocean are necessary for electric cars, mobile phones and other technology. Those in favour of deep sea mining say it can be done in a controlled way and can help in our green transition. Environmentalists, however, are calling to ban all extractive activity from this unique ocean ecosystem. Yes, there is commercial interest in pushing it forward, but there are questions around whether we actually really need these minerals for our future, say, for instance, transport um, infrastructure. And I think it's almost like a quick fix in that if we were to really deal with some of the, you know, the issues around, around, for instance, transport, around changing human behaviour about the way, you know, our expectations about how we use cars, for instance, we can do quite a lot to alleviate the need for these metals. And technology changes quite fast. You know, we already know that there's potential for a cobalt-free battery, for instance. So I think if we're, you know, if we're really considering potentially impacting a relatively pristine and very important um, deep sea ecosystem, you know, yet another commercial industry in our deep oceans, then I think, you know, we're asking the wrong questions and we're looking in the wrong direction. We should maybe look more at how can we alleviate the need for these minerals in general. Did you know that Europe's North Sea is home to a significant population of snapping shrimp? These tiny creatures with their powerful snapping claws create a constant crackling sound that contributes to the overall ambient noise in the North Sea. And now to another aspect of ocean noise and one that I personally have absolutely loved hearing more about, the sounds of reefs and fish. We, we, we all teach our children, don't we, that, that fish don't make any noise at all. They just sit there going, you know, maybe they make a little quiet pop at best. But actually, fish are really vocal. Uh, there's loads of different noises they make. That's Timothy Lamont, a marine biologist at the Lancaster Environment Centre in the UK. Through his work, he's trying to understand the inner workings of healthy reefs to guide efforts in restoring degraded ecosystems. Sure. A healthy coral reef is the loudest ecosystem in the sea. It's full of all sorts of different and diverse and wonderfully bizarre and strange sounds. So the first thing you'll hear on a coral reef is this backing track, if you like, of snapping shrimp. And these are thousands and thousands of these little snapping shrimp that clip their claws as they go about their lives living in, in and under the corals. And together they create this like static sound. And then as you listen more carefully, punctuated through that background sound, you'll hear the sounds of fishes, which are really quite varied actually. So some fishes sort of make these deep booming grunting sounds, others make this growling sound, or, or sometimes a more gentle purring sound. And some of them are higher pitched and make these sort of almost whooping sounds. They, they can be quite melodic in some cases. In 2020, Timothy Lamont conducted extensive research on coral reefs across the Indo-Pacific region. 
And quite quickly, he began to see patterns of sound-making behaviour related to changes in the environment, including from the claw-snapping shrimp. They'll make these cavitation bubbles as they clip their claws to either hunt or to fight with each other. If you put your head underwater on a coral reef anywhere in the world, you'll hear this sound. Uh, on reefs I've recorded, it tends to be louder on the new moon, actually, and a little bit quieter on the full moon. And some of that is to do with reproductive cycles with some of these animals. So a lot of the, the noises are made related to courtship and a lot of behaviour is around courtship and reproduction. And some of it is to do with yeah, when, when there's food available and when the... Uh, you know, when there's more food in the water and more animals are out hunting and, and eating, you'll, you'll hear more sounds associated with those behaviours as well. To eavesdrop on the fishy conversations around the coral reefs, the scientists use a special underwater microphone called a hydrophone. We're discovering more and more the, the more we go. And, and one of the reasons their noises are so diverse is because they have lots of different ways of making noise. So, for instance... Some of them will play their swim bladders like a drum. They have these muscles around their swim bladder, which is a bag of air in the gut of the fish. And when they tense those muscles, it bangs against the side of this bag of air and makes this sort of thumping sound. Others of them, uh, for example, clownfish can use their teeth to make sound. So they'll chatter their teeth together and make these, these percussive noises. And some of them can actually make sound in two different ways at the same time. The sounds emitted around coral reefs can be influenced by factors such as the composition of the reef, the species present and the environmental conditions. Different reef habitats and locations can exhibit distinct acoustic signatures. For example, a reef with a high coral cover might have a different sound profile compared to a reef dominated by seagrass beds. And what's totally fascinating is that baby fish will be attracted by a happy-sounding reef. So juvenile fish will, at the very start of their life, they're out in the open sea, out, out in the plankton, in, in deep water. And then as they grow up and as they transition into the adult phase of their life, they'll come back to a reef. And one of the ways that they find and choose a reef to settle on is by listening to the sound signature of that reef. However, corals are bleaching. They lose their bright colours due to stress, usually caused by high water temperatures from climate change and pollution. When corals bleach, they become weak and more vulnerable to disease and death, and this affects many other creatures that rely on them for survival. When the Great Barrier Reef bleached infamously in, in 2016 and 2017, there was the first of these very big bleaching events to hit the Barrier Reef. We discovered that not only did some reefs on the Barrier Reef sound completely different as a result of the damage, they were much quieter, but we found they sounded less attractive to juvenile fish. If you're wondering how to tell the difference, then listen to this. It's the sound of a healthy reef in New Caledonia, recorded by Reef Pulse. And this is the sound of a reef in bad shape in La Réunion. So Timothy Lamont found that if a reef didn't sound very happy or healthy, the fish didn't want to live there which begs the question of whether you can use sound to help the reef to recover. That was quite a depressing thing to find, but it also gave us this idea for restoring reefs that actually if we could change the soundscape for the better, we could probably increase fish numbers. So we ran this experiment where we took these underwater loudspeakers and on little artificial experiment reefs that we'd made, we played the sound of a really, really healthy buzzing reef and then on other ones, we played the sound of a damaged, degraded reef. And we found that by just playing the sound of a healthy reef without changing anything else about the reef itself, we could double the number of fish that came and settled on those experimental patch reefs. In a way, they were kind of tricking the fish into thinking these reefs were a happy place to swim. It was an exciting sort of proof of concept that by altering the soundscape, you could alter the decisions these fishes are making and you could increase the speed at which fishes will colonise a habitat. That has encouraging potential to contribute to restoration if you're also restoring coral and removing the other threats that face these ecosystems, bringing in the fish is an important part of that jigsaw. One thing that we learned was that this is not a fix-all solution. So, in our experiment, we wanted to isolate the impact of the noise experimentally. So we didn't change anything else about the reef. We just played the sound. 
But what we found was fish were very attracted to the sound, turned up, and then there was still no coral there for them, right? We'd, we'd essentially tricked them in, in this experiment. The conclusion is that repopulating corals with happy soundscapes isn't a standalone solution in itself. Yeah, that was a powerful enough effect that they stayed, but they didn't have what they needed. There was still no coral there, that there was not enough habitat, that sort of thing. So so I think the the danger is that this is is seen as a solution that can sort out all the problems, which it definitely can't. I think this needs to be deployed in addition to removing pollutants, removing other threats, planting corals, sorting out the benthic habitat, all of that stuff. And only at that point will calling in fish become something that's useful in addition to those other interventions. As Timothy Lamont says, there's no easy fix to ecosystem restoration. And if you'd like to know more, I suggest you scroll back to our podcast episode discussing exactly how tricky it can be. OK, you're probably becoming a bit of an expert on underwater sounds by now, so it's high time for our Ocean Calls quiz. I'll play you a sound and then give you a few seconds to choose the correct answer. So here are the options read by our very talented producer, Naira. Take it away, Naira. Is this the sound of... A. Tropical rain falling on the ocean. B. A grazing parrotfish. C. A fish spawning on a coral reef. It was B. A parrotfish grazing. This brightly coloured fish roves over the reefs to feed and spends over 90% of its time eating. Using their beak-like jaws, they remove algae along with portions of coral leaving visible bite marks. Thank you to Reef Pulse for sharing this sound with us. Now, let's move on to the next one. Is this the sound of A, an earthquake, B, a wave breaking on a coral reef, or C, thunder from a storm heard beneath the waves? The answer was A. That was the underwater sound of an earthquake. The movement of the seafloor makes low-frequency sounds that can be heard far away from the earthquake location. Thanks to the Laboratory of Applied Bioacoustics for sharing this recording with us. Now, question number three. Is this the sound of A. Sonar B. A narwhal, or C, an orca. The answer was B, a narwhal. These animals with the long toothy tusk are happiest in pack ice around the Arctic Ocean. They're relatively small whales and produce a variety of vocalisations to communicate. Thanks to the Laboratory of Applied Bioacoustics for sharing that recording with us too. Now to the last one. Is this the sound of A, a scientific experiment, B, a sperm whale, or C, a blue whale? That was C, a blue whale. The largest living mammal makes an intense sound that can be louder than a jet engine. Blue whales can hear each other at a distance of over 800 kilometres. Thanks again to the Laboratory of Applied Bioacoustics for sharing that recording. Well, that's all for now. Please scroll back and have a listen to some of the other episodes if you missed them. I personally think the discussion about undersea cables is probably one of the most surprising we've had this season, so if you haven't heard it, then give it a go. Ocean Calls is produced by Euronews for ocean fans around the world, and I'm your host, science reporter Jeremy Wilkes, 